Good morning, my name is Mrs. Meekins. This is my 12th grade honors English class at Glen Allen High School. We are going to be introducing the novel 1984 by George Orwell this morning. So to get into 1984, I wanted us to take some time and think about the relevance of this book and set the stage historically for it. It's 1944 and George Orwell is in England and what's going on in England? World War II, and it's like things are terrible in England at this time during World War II. And George Orwell's looking around at the society that he sees, and he's concerned about where our world is going. And so as early as 1944, he's composing letters to friends. He's talking about these ideas of the society that he's worried about. And eventually, in 1949, he publishes this book, 1984. And we'll look at letter, a letter that he wrote back in 1944 that has all of those ideas that then become this novel that he decides to write. And the reason why we still study it today is because, as you'll find out in just a couple of minutes, it's still a really relevant story. So he imagines a society in 1984. And while 1984, the actual year, didn't turn out quite like the 1984 he imagined, I think you'll see in just a couple of minutes, we're kind of living in 1984 right now. So what I need you to do, on your tables, you have these envelopes. And in the envelopes, there are a bunch of different questions. Have each person pull one question from the envelope. Take a moment, consider the question that you pull, and then share your question and your idea of an answer with everybody at your table. Once everybody has a chance to get their question and look at it, we'll start with the person who is geographically closest to my desk. So based on where you're sitting, figure out who that closest person is, and then you'll share your question, your current idea of an answer, and then we'll move around the table clockwise. Go ahead and start. Mm -hmm. Share your question and then explain what your answer is. I think it's because some people are just more vocal than others because like I don't know, some people just feel like, oh, I should just sit here and do nothing and just make, just wish something would change, and some people are like, okay, I'm going to make sure this changes. Well, they could, but did, they don't really have the means to stand against it. They don't really have much power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I guess the voice of the people is stronger than we think. I mean, because there's so many people going against the government, it's possible. I mean, you never know. Okay, let's come back together and talk about what your tables discussed real briefly. If you look at the board, these are all of the questions that showed up in those envelopes. And, and you didn't have a chance to discuss every single question, but all of these questions have something to do with the novel that we're about to start reading. So I'm going to pick on Carla. What question did you choose out of the envelope, Carla? So how did you define power? What is power? Um, I said it's kind of like a combination of wealth and control. Wealth and control, all right. And then how is it, did you say, how is it used? Um, well, I mean, it could be used to control other people. OK. In a good way or a bad way. Oh, in a good way or a bad way. So power can be used for good, but it can also be used for evil, right? Keegan, what about you? What question did you pull from the envelope? Um, I got the question, can changing language change your thought? I said yes, because I think like neurologically, if you learn a new language, it rewires your brain to ah. think a different way. All right, so, so a good idea in this, if we change the language, we're able to think differently because we have 
a broader understanding of words and how they're used. Yeah. You're thinking of a different language. What about in English? So for those of us who speak English all the time, how can our understanding of language affect how we function in society? Chaitanya, what do you think? Can changing language change thought? Um, think about just in English. Yes, because like you need to be able to like communicate with others, so, like you can get your thoughts out. And, like, what happens if you have a really limited grasp of the language? How do you struggle? You can't efficiently get your ideas out. Why not? Because you can't like portray your ideas, people can't perceive what you're trying to tell them. So if I don't have the words, then I can't communicate. I feel like I said this too when we were talking about your college essays. We need to think about the language that we're using so that we can effectively get our ideas across. And if we have a limited ability to use the language, we have a limited ability to really convey the ideas that we truly want to convey. Let's look at one more. Travis, what question did you pick? Uh, shoot. It was uh, how do governments balance the rights of individuals with the common good? Ah. Uh, I just said that's basically the Bill of Rights. Okay. So we in, an, we in the United States balance the rights of individuals by the laws that we have created. So we, by, by uh, enacting and, and following the laws that we've made, it helps us then balance individual versus society. All right. Anybody think that that's different? How do we balance the rights of individuals? Do we balance them well? No. Kaylee, Simone, you said no. How come? It, it is, like I said that because of like the way the, the justice system is set up, it's, it's not really beneficial to those that go through it, I guess. Oh, so who would you say is, or are you saying the government stacks the deck in its own favor? So maybe that goes back to that idea of power that Carla had. When we're in power, what are we often trying to do? Once I have power, what do I want to do? I want to keep it, right? I don't want to relinquish that power. So now this gets into the heart of the ideas in 1984. Take a look at the board, and these are some statements that Orwell makes in 1984. He says things like, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. So 1984 is published back in 1949, and it was a popular book, and it remained a popular book. I studied this book when I was in high school, and then January of 2017 hits, and 1984, which had always been a pretty popular book, skyrockets back to the top of the bestsellers, bestsellers list. It's at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. It's at the top of USA Today's bestseller list. It's at the top of Amazon's bestseller list. January and February, it sits as number one on the bestseller list. As you look at these statements, why? Can you connect any one of those statements to 2017? Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. How could we relate that to 2017 politically? Mm, with, um, with the change in the presidency, okay. maybe? How, explain a little bit more. Well, a lot of people were unhappy with the new president, so maybe they're kind of trying to hold on what America used to have, in a way. Oh, so it can start, go ahead. By saying, like, what controls the past can still control the future, even though, um, like, the person in the house changed, that may not have to change everything. Okay, so maybe there's a concern to hold on to the ideals that you wanted from previous administrations. Can we interpret that a little bit differently as well? Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. 
Think to your history textbooks. Think to the history that you studied in school. What dictates what you study in school? Historically. Yes, but what do you mean by the winners? Like people who write history are typically the people who have won it in like battles and stuff. Oh. Right, they're good history, not bad. And so, yeah, and so if, if I'm the winner and I get to tell the story of what happened, how am I probably going to make myself look? I'm going to be the hero in that story, right? So if I'm the winner, I get to control the storytelling. I get to decide what that story sounds like. So then that goes right down to this statement. For after all, how do we know that two and two make four? How can you prove to me that two and two make four? Connor shakes his head. We can't. Why can't you prove two and two make four, Connor? Because someone made it up. And just <laughs> followed it. I don't know. Why did we follow it? Oh, that's what everyone else was doing? Can we be certain that the force of gravity works? Yes. <laughs> you think so? What if all of these ideas are just in our mind? And I want you to think of it this way. So you leave class today, and you say, oh, that class, I was so happy when it was over. But I leave class, and I say, that was the best class I've ever taught in my life. Which one of us is right? So can we hold two contradictory ideas at the same time? Which one of them is reality? So is reality subjective or objective? Subjective. Reality is subjective, so how do I know that two and two make four? How do I know that the force of gravity exists? Is that just because I've chosen to believe it? Or is that because it is an objective reality? You guys just told me objective reality doesn't exist. It's definitely an objective reality. How? Explain. All right, so they're just labels for things. So like two is just a label for having like Two of these. So if we okay. have, <laughs> <laughs> say like A and B, right? Okay. And instead of three, it could be like C and D. Okay. And all together, it makes L. Like they're just labels for like actuality. Oh. And like the force of gravity, we could call it like, the, like it could be like the force yeah. of a whiteboard. Like okay. They just call it gravity because that's what keeps you on the earth. So you you argue for an objective reality. What if nobody else believes that? What if you are the only person who believes that reality is objective? What do the rest of us do to you? I become a minority and I have to rise up and explain my ideas. Do you think that's difficult? Do you think well, let me ask that question. I, mean, I just did, it was pretty easy. But what if we all what if we all decide what if we all decide he's crazy and that, that's not accurate at all? Um, they said all the great scientists were crazy. <laughs> so you're just going to have to be part of that minority. Yeah. Travis, I saw you shaking your head. I, I was just going to say, like, there's, there is, like, an objective reality, but there's opinions as well. Okay. So, like... The way you explain things can be subjective, and that's how like psychology works. You know, somebody who's schizophrenic, everything they see that's not reality, uh -huh. that's their perception of reality. So compared to the actual reality, we might perceive things differently, but there is an objective part and then the subjective part. Okay. Which I guess you could even consider to be sort of subjective, like okay. what you call something, it might be different to everybody, you, since we don't know every language. So language is subjective, but there's still an objective reality. So going with what Stone says, there's this subjective way of describing things, but ultimately there is an objective reality. So 2017, is there another statement that we can connect to 2017? Keegan, help us out. Take one of these statements and connect it to 2017. Okay. Um, the choice for mankind lies between freedom and happiness, and for the bulk of mankind, happiness is better. Ah. Uh. I think. Do I have to get political? You can take this in whatever road you want. Okay. I'm not very good at political. Um, I was gonna say I have, 
I think it's true. Happiness is like we want freedom, of course, but I think it's almost that, like interchangeable. Freedom is happiness, um, and a lot of people are, you know, they fight for their rights and they fight for um, freedom, especially in other countries. <clears throat> and uh, I, I feel like a lot of people aren't happy in their country because they're not free. Okay. Um, and I don't really know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need freedom to be happy? No, but it's preferable. Oh, okay, it's preferable, but not necessarily. <laughs> Kayla, you shook your head no. Why don't we need freedom to be happy? Um, I mean, as long as you're like happy with your, like, with your surroundings. All right. Yes, I, I mean, I don't know. Quick show of hands. How many need freedom to be happy? A min okay, a, a pretty okay, small minority. Jake, you had a question? I mean, it's kind of hard to like ask this a question because nobody in this room never like has lived without it. Like we don't know like the other side of the wall that do live without freedom at all. Okay, so because you all have virtually lived lived your entire lives in a very free system that at least provides you what we assume is freedom then we, we don't necessarily know how to live without it. Travis, do you want to? I, I was going to also say, like, there's sort of different levels of freedom in a way. Oh. Like, you know, we have freedom of speech, freedom of press. Mm -hmm. But what, what exactly is not being free? I guess you consider maybe somebody in jail isn't free. Okay. Or, you know, somebody who just doesn't, isn't able to do what they want if you're trapped in some way. But I guess that's like physical freedom. So there's like different types of freedom we Absolutely. obviously aren't perfectly free, otherwise we wouldn't have laws. But True, like, true. You think about you guys live under your parents' houses still, so your parents' rules for the most part prevail. Do you still feel free even though you're in the confines of their expectations and their rules? Yes. No, okay, for the most part you're shaking your heads yes. One more time, let's pick something else for... 2017 connection. Colson, did you say you have one? Um, well, I was looking at the one until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. Okay. I mean, I think like with all of the political stuff going on and people protesting for different things and their rights, I feel like that fits. Explain that a little bit more. Why, why 2017? Could, why could we maybe not necessarily say that for every year in history? I think you're on to something. Does anybody want to expand on that a little bit further? We don't always have the freedom to rebel. Okay, so we, we in more modern times are more free to rebel. Connor, what were you going to say? I think it kind of goes like with a like group thing. Like people like to think with a group. Uh huh. So if you get a group together that thinks one way, like it's attractive. All right, so are you saying the group becomes conscious and they have rebelled, or? Yeah, like the, the people inside the group become conscious. Okay, all right, and so what's the problem with this, though? There's a catch-22 in this statement. So they don't work together. Paradox Yeah, we can't rebel until we're conscious, but we won't become conscious until we rebel. So now we gotta start thinking about what does conscious mean and even what this idea of what does rebellion mean. All right, these are some prime ideas from 1984. Thank you for joining our class today. I hope you enjoyed our lesson on 1984. Go Jazz! <laughs>